evening, everyone. Looks like everyone is coming into the presentation room. So welcome on this Tuesday night. We appreciate you being with us. I think we'll go ahead and get started right off the bat. We have a full agenda today. Um, my name is Kelsey Bless. I am the CFS Licensing Unit Administrator, and I will be co-facilitating today's training with Brittany. Brittany, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Brittany Fodi. I'm a Licensing and Level of Care Administrator within Children and Family Services with the new Licensing Unit. And we will be excited to talk to you tonight about many things, but I oversee respite and shelter care, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Wonderful. And so we so appreciate everyone being here. Just a couple of quick announcements before we get deep into the agenda. So the first announcement is that we do not um, have social work CEUs available for um, the social workers, case managers are invited to this as well. So there's not social work CEUs, but you can count today's training for foster parent or foster care provider training hours. So if you are still needing to get your hours for your year, you can absolutely count um, this hour and a half of training towards your foster care provider license. Um, foster parents, there will be a list of participants that are attending today's training um, sent to the CFS licensing unit, um, as well as Nexus Path, um, our tribal social service offices, um, the URM program and youth work. So if you are a licensed um, foster care provider with one of those agencies, they will get a list of participants from this particular training that we're doing live. This training is going to be recorded, so you may um, have someone that you want to, to view this at a later time, they absolutely can do so. Um, you will not be getting certificates, so you would just track the, the day and the time that you um, took this training and we will confirm it on that list um, if we need to verify. Um, but if you are wanting something to verify you were here, go ahead and take a screenshot or take a picture of, of the screen today and that'll help trigger your memory that you were here today and um, foster care providers will be tracking their own time. If you are here today and there's more than one of you um, logged in, please in the chat put the names of the individuals that are with you so that they can get credit on the participation list as well. And we will not be opening up um, the lines for, for questions. Um, we will be using the chat. Um, we have a pretty full agenda. We want to get through everything. And if there's time at the end, um, we absolutely could, you know, try to open up some lines, but at this point, we'll use the chat and respond accordingly to that. Um, the recording of this will go on to the CFSTC website, probably in the next, you know, week to 10 days or so um, before it gets posted. And then we have some handouts. This PowerPoint itself will be shared with all of you, as well as two um, handouts that you will see in today's um, training. And so we'll try to get them either uploaded into the chat when the time is right, um, but you'll also get them emailed to you after. So we'll go ahead and get started. So today's agenda, we are gonna be addressing the foster care providers and the, the various levels of foster care that we offer here in North Dakota, as well as the opportunities. And so Brittany will be talking more about the respite and shelter as well as our substitute care. And then we'll wrap up today um, with additional opportunities that really are channeled through our recruitment and retention contract that we have with CFSTC and we work so closely with. Now, Whenever we do a training and we have the opportunity to collaborate with both case managers and foster care providers, it's so critically important that we review and have a, a moment to shed light on roles and responsibilities. Um, we, we know that even with us here at the CFS licensing unit, um, we're new uh, as a newly developed redesign project and we're so happy to be able to be a trifecta essentially. You know, we offer that license um, to all of the providers from family homes through treatment foster care all the way to qualified residential treatment programs in our facilities. And so there's a wide range. Um, and so we see that and we have the opportunity then to get to work with both case managers who are facilitating planning for children and all of you who are foster care providers who offer that great service and opening your homes to children. So I'm not going to go through this whole list, but ultimately the the case manager gets to make the decision on when and where a child is placed into a home and providers have this 
amazing opportunity, but the largest impact as you are touching the lives of so many children that are placed in and out of your home throughout their case time. We're going to scroll to the next one, and I think making placement decisions becomes such a, a difficult yet um, a happy moment in the life of case planning, and making that right placement decision at the right time um, is something that case managers are having to um, do each day. And so determining that level of care is something that we really want to stress. So this looks really little on the screen. We recognize that. You will all get this. Um, as an attachment in the chat, and we'll be emailing it again. Um, but the level of care document was really an opportunity for children and family services to help paint a picture of where children are placed in our system, but also at what levels and when. So you'll notice on this chart the parameters in which a child can be placed in that particular level. And in the very first columns, the preventative placements, those are children who are placed in potentially a foster care provider's home and or a relative's home, but they are not in public custody. It is a diversion opportunity for custodial agencies or the in-home program or child protective services to be able to engage with the community in an effort to divert a child from ever entering foster care. And so we do have some foster care providers on the call today who are shelter care providers. Um, they also are, you know, wearing two hats. They're a licensed provider and they're also offering shelter care. And we're going to be talking more about what shelter care is um, and, and allowing you to explore if that's something that you can also offer um, in your service area. As we get to the middle quadrant of this um, handout, it's the foster care placements. And when we say a foster care placement, it is a, a reimbursable or paid placement that um, the department will uh, reimburse to the families. And so we have um, the licensed family foster homes, which many of you are. We also have the treatment foster care program, which is currently uh, managed through Nexus Path. Uh, Nexus Path has been a good partner of ours for a number of years, and they offer the treatment foster care level. The, the third level within that foster care placement area is the qualified residential treatment programs. And those are our, also known as QRTPs. Um, they really are serving the, the deep end, the high needs, the treatment related um, sort of crisis oriented cases. And time limited. We have had a huge push in our state um, and nationally to reduce the number of children who are in congregate care or in residential settings and really trying to bolster uh, the, the placement options for children to be um, in the least restrictive level of care, eating dinner at a family table with all of you and um, being able to have some normalcy in their day-to-day -day structure. And so um, the family foster care level and the treatment foster care level um, are where the bulk of our homes lie um, today. The very far right is something that we feel is really important because yes, it's a foster care placement, but um, it is unique in it. It's not the high end, it's not, you know, deep needs of, of characteristics or children's, um, or children's needs, but um, it is unique in that we have an agency and Nexus Path um, has contracts with a variety of apartment um, vendors who offer supervised independent living. And so the agency themselves is licensed through our division um, and they work collectively to support the 18 plus continued care youth. Now, some family homes have the 18 plus placements, but we also have supervised independent living as another level of care in our state. These are the family levels. So we have our unlicensed relatives. So when, and we're going to get into a little bit about if you're unlicensed, um, it is non-reimbursable. We need to have a license in order to reimburse the, the family home. Um, we have our state homes, which all operate 100% through the CFS licensing unit. We have an amazing group of professional staff who have um, transitioned from many zone uh, employments um, to the state employment as of April. 
2022 and our unit is up and running and they're doing amazing. So those state homes are run solely through CFS licensing unit. We also work closely with our tribal nations. We have a Title IV-E agreement signed with four of our tribes here in North Dakota. And the tribal licensors work diligently to find homes on or near the reservation that can be approved by our office. So we work with the tribal offices as well. Next is PATH. We do the treatment foster care licensure and they also have regular. So the bottom two boxes that you see there are family level of care licenses that are um, initially home studied and assessed through Nexus PATH and then sent to um, CFS licensing unit for the final license being issued by the state. YouthWorks has a unique option, which is a host home. Uh, they serve pr predominantly teenage females who uh, may have been uh, a victim of or at risk of sex trafficking. They do some specialized programming and training with families to work with um, that ask at risk uh, population. And so we have um, YouthWorks continuing to seek out providers to work in that realm as well. And lastly, we have our unaccompanied refugee minor program, which is actually managed through Agassiz Valley Zone. And those staff are working with families who are part of and connected to the refugee resettlement program. So they mirror the foster care rules and regulations to identify families who can serve the children in the refugee program. Now let's just put all of those licensed providers in the same hat. It doesn't matter which walk of uh, life or what agency the provider is working with. These opportunities present themselves to all levels. And so we have shelter care providers. We have um, shelter care on call, which we're gonna learn more about today. Our respite care providers our substitute care providers. So there's a lot of words in here that we want to really dig deep and help show the difference in what they are. It's helpful for case managers to have this knowledge when they're working with families as a support. And it's really helpful as well for our foster care providers to have the same common language. Another opportunity that foster care providers have is to be um, offering some child care. That's new. We're going to talk about that here shortly. Uh, we have mentoring opportunities. We also have a North Dakota task force. We met today. Um, there's about 15 uh, North Dakota foster care providers who are part of the task force. And um, we get to solicit feedback and brainstorm some solutions and really have some creative mindset in moving some initiatives forward, which actually is a reflection of the child care provider opportunity that we just had passed. Um, so credit to our North Dakota Provider Task Force for, you know, hanging in there and, and dealing with my very solid agendas, which we try to get through as much as we can. And then the last on here is the Recruitment and Retention Coalitions. So those are local opportunities that we'll address here um, towards the end of today's training. So why licensed? Um, why do we get licensed? Why do providers choose to get licensed? And this is not a full extensive list, um, but we do want to just highlight, you know, the positive impacts that you all have on children and families in the communities. Case managers and our custodial agencies, they work so hard every day to be trying to identify uh, the most appropriate placement for children and recognizing that case managers too have a great impact on how that plan will be successful and how that plan can get moved um, to permanency for those children. We recognize that providers, they offer a temporary support, um, but we can't say it enough that even though it's a temporary support, there's lifelong impacts that are made each day when accepting a child into placement. And for our case managers, making that decision on which home um, is going to best suit the needs of this child and family until permanency can be achieved. We know that it's nice to get a little education and training. We hope that we can provide the technical assistance that you need when you need it and the support where and when you need it as well. Um, and then ultimately, it's helpful. It's not the reason folks go into this because you definitely don't get reimbursed the, the amount that it costs. But um, there is a reimbursement option when we hold a license from the department. And so that is really helpful. 
Now we have unlicensed caregivers. There's some funding available to support unlicensed caregivers, but um, the value and the, the dollar funding amount is less. Um, you know, we're continuing to always explore opportunities for what that could mean differently um, for uh, families so that we can support keeping children with family whenever possible. But we do have the Kinship ND program. Um, the website is located there and it's uh, it does offer some financial assistance, but it really offers a lot of resource and referral. So um, if you are familiar with an individual who maybe is a grandparent, auntie, uncle to um, a child, in or out of foster care, they can be served through that program. So it's definitely worth um, looking into. And then lastly, for the unlicensed caregivers, we do have an opportunity through the TANF Kinship Care Program, which is funded through economic assistance. And that's about half the uh, reimbursement factor of the daily rate for becoming a licensed foster parent, but you do not have to hold a license in order to get those funds. So just something to be aware of, and as you might know of other people, um, or if you're a case manager, it's helpful to have that variance in knowing what levels might be available to the families you're serving. So before I turn it over to Brittany, I want to talk about this, the task force request of the department to be thinking differently about child care. So we wanted to offer a supplement and really support our child care providers in, in North Dakota. So um, just this past summer, we reviewed our state policy and we reflected on our federal regulations, which indicated that we did have an opportunity to allow for a licensed foster care provider to serve in the capacity to help support um, your fellow foster care providers by offering child care. And so there is some eligibility for uh, child care reimbursement that is allowable through our irregular payments um, and needs to be approved by the case manager of the child. We do have some caps. It's $5 an hour that we allow for. So we, you know, we aren't allowing the higher rates of eight or 10 bucks an hour, but um, even $5 an hour to support those needs of children after school. And um, maybe some of the geography constraints that we have in our state. You know, we have been hearing from foster care providers that are driving 35, 42 miles one way to get a child to a daycare. Um, while they work. And we know that's a real issue. We know that it's um, definitely something that needs to be uh, reviewed. And so we had the task force say, you know, we know that there's foster parents who uh, maybe are retired and they have some time during the day and their kids that they have in placement are um, at school. And I just need two or three hours, three times a week because I work part time. And um, I just can't find daycare for that little amount of time. That's one, you know, opportunity. The other is we all know we have children who are coming into our care and they have some pretty high um, needs for supervision. And there's not a lot of child care uh, facilities or even child care homes that are taking those 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds um, after school and they could benefit from that supervision. So we would allow for the reimbursement um, as a uh, child care rate. So if you're a licensed foster parent, you have a little capacity during the day to let the case manager at your agency know because there might be another foster parent looking for some help with infant care, which is also hard to find, or that after school care um, for, you know, two, three hours a day um, until they're done with work. So just a way to really support our peers. We do have a, a form to fill out in the event that this is something that um, would work for a foster care provider. The SFN 920, which is our child care form for reimbursement, we would use that same form. We would have the case manager approve this and they would be submitting it to our foster care subadopt unit for reimbursement. Uh, we would then pay the primary foster parent who then reimburses the foster parent who's offering the child care. So it operate much like we do today. We do we have a constraint in our system and someday we'll be able to fix it. But for now, we can only pay the licensed provider who has the child in placement. So for all the costs associated with that child, our system only allows us to pay the primary placement provider. So that's all the daycare, that's all of the clothing allowance, um, the daily reimbursement, et cetera, goes directly to the primary placement. 
So with that, I think um, we're going to dig a little deeper and go into the difference between shelter care, respite care, and substitute care. So I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. I'm going to mute myself and um, interject accordingly. Thanks, Kelsey. Good evening, everyone. So as Kelsey said, with the implementation of the CFS licensing unit that started on April 1st, um, we had realized that um, many of these terms were used um, as a blanket statement, I need respite. And so what we came to realize is that we wanted to make this available to not only U.S. providers, but our case managers across the state so that you guys are using universal language when it comes to requesting certain um, things such as respite care, shelter care, or substitute care. And so this is a handout that you are going to receive um, through the chat and also through the handout after um, the training that we want you as providers to look at um, and know when you're requesting something, this is exactly what it is. The, the one pager also has examples for each of them and we're gonna go into each of these um, scenarios throughout this PowerPoint. And so if you have questions, please ask them in the chat and we'll respond accordingly. So first we're gonna start with substitute care. Again, with the creation of the licensing unit, we wanted to be very clear about what substitute care is. And so substitute care is just that. A provider is unavailable to care for a child for more than a portion of a day. It is pre-planned. They know this weekend they are gonna be painting their house and they need someone to watch the child. Um, they are reaching out to the custodian to approve that substitute care. And so this is something that can be done from provider to provider or with the child's identified relative. And so when we talk about the duration of substitute care, substitute care cannot last longer than that 14 days unless it's approved by the CFS licensing unit or um, the permanency administration unit. And so when we talk about bed space, and your licensing specialists are likely talking to you about this um, initially and annually thereafter. So bed space, in order for it to be considered permanent, has to be that permanent bed. It's a bed within the home. Um, temporary bed space, if you have a child there for substitute care, cannot last longer than that seven days. And so it's an air mattress, it's a pullout couch, it's a place where the child has to sleep while they're in your home. But if the child is in substitute care and there's only temporary bed space, that case manager is likely working with you as the provider to say, where is the child going to sleep? If, if you're going on a cruise for eight days, can you tell me or show me where the child's going to sleep for those eight days? And so again, a substitute care provider does not have to be a licensed provider, but you as providers likely are aware of each other and calling in the event that you need someone to watch your child for the weekend. But a substitute care provider can also be an identified relative of that child. So if we have someone who um, the child has been with you for a year and your parents are like grandma and grandpa to the child, you can work with your case manager to say, is this an identified relative of this child? And could my parents watch this child? Or can the child's aunt and uncle watch this child? And so when we talk about, again, substitute care, it does not have to be that licensed provider. It could be someone who is an identified relative of the provider and you're working with that custodial case manager to determine if the child is an identified relative um, of the person you are seeking to to place the child with while, again, you're going on vacation or whatever the scenario may be. And so if you are seeking to place a child with a licensed provider, the CFS licensing unit does not reimburse for um, substitute care arrangements. Those are arrangements that are made um, between providers with the approval of the custodial case managers. You know, what we recommend that does occur if provider A um, is seeking substitute care with another licensed provider is that you are working with your custodial case manager to say, here's the daily rate that I receive for this child and I'm going out of town for two days. I will reimburse you the daily rate that I receive for the child for those two days so that the providers are working together to, to maintain that relationship and really reimburse each other um, 
because one provider is unavailable. And if you have questions when you guys um, may request substitute care about the daily rate, your custodial case manager is likely the point of contact who knows exactly what the daily rate of is of that the child in their home is getting. And if not, your licensing specialist within the licensing unit would know what the daily rate is as well. And so we know that there are examples that we hear a lot about, like, is this respite care or is this substitute care? So we're trying to really manage what you guys see as substitute care and really give you a clear picture of what this may be. And so for instance, we may have a licensed provider that's going on vacation for a week. They know that um, they have a relationship with, the, with a child's aunt. They are working with that custodial case manager to say, you know, I've talked to the child's aunt. The aunt is willing to care for the child for that week while I'm out of state. Is this okay? And so the custodial agency would be, you know, completing a public search to say, yes, this aunt has been a part of the child and family teams. We know who she is. She's involved in the case planning. And this is an appropriate substitute care arrangement for the child. And this allows the child to be in the most familiar placement to them outside of the licensed provider that they are with. This would be an example of substitute care that you guys may see with children that are placed in your home. This um, other example of substitute care, I think, you know, we always think, oh, it's good to have our own reprieve, get away, get out of town. And so um, I'm just going to use this as an example of Brittany and I. So if if I am heading to a concert and I'm going out of town for the weekend, I'm going to be gone Friday through Sunday. And I know that Brittany's a licensed provider. She's got a couple kids. Our kids get together on occasion. Um, they know each other. It would really be, you know, a support to me if she was willing and able to take on the two children that I have in placement for the weekend. So I ask if she's available. She says, yes, I am. That's not a problem. And then I call the case manager for my two children and say, um, I plan to go to town. Brittany is also a foster parent. You might be familiar with her. She's willing to take the children. Um, are you okay with this? And that case manager would ask, do you know about the bed space? Because it is important. Every child who comes into our um, care and into our placements needs to have a bed. We, we're not bed sharing. That's not the way we do business. And we want to ensure that that's covered. And if the case manager reviews it and approves it, then we're off to the races. And when I get back on Sunday night, I can either write Brittany a check or sometimes providers will say, you know what, just wait till you get reimbursed and then just pay me then or reimburse me then. No big deal. So a lot of it is just a private arrangement. So here's another great example of substitute care. So we have, again, two providers. They're going out of town for a wedding for the weekend and the kids aren't invited. And we know that that happens, right? So the provider is talking to the custodial case manager of those kids and saying, I know of a provider who can watch these kids for the weekend. The custodial case manager is giving that approval for the child or children to be placed with that, that family for the weekend. And the providers are working together to arrange for payment, whether that is after they pick them up, like Kelsey said, or when they're reimbursed. These are a private arrangement done between providers, the case managers verifying the bed space and approving that substitute care arrangement. And one of the questions that's coming in before we get into respite care is specific to identified relatives. So the North Dakota Century Code identifies a relative as blood relation to the child or someone who is known to them in the community. So quite a few years ago, we did a substitute care um, policy that went into play from Children and Family Services because there was a lot of confusion and children were being placed with all kinds of, you know, individuals who maybe weren't licensed. We ended up changing our law in North Dakota to allow for this sort of kin relationship. So if I have two children placed in my home, and those children are very well known to my family, my parents, my sister, um, and I'm going out of town for the weekend, and my children are going to my mom and dad's, I could say that technically our children that have been placed in foster care are 
no win to my family, to my parents, and the custodial case manager gets to make that final call. I could say, you know what, we go to the farm every weekend, the kids are always playing with the animals, they, you know, they love going to my parents' house, my kids are going to my parents' house, would it be okay if the two children in placement also join them? Um, they would categorically be considered identified relatives based on the connection that those children have with my parents. And so it's just a nice way that our law allowed for some flexibility, um, but ultimately the custodian um, gets to make that final say. So yes, you can consider your family an identified relative to the child if in fact they are. You have a connection with them, they see them, they know them, and the case manager can approve them. Thanks, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. So we're going to transition to respite care. And this is one thing that has been universally used for almost every scenario that we've seen come through the CFS licensing unit. And so by policy, you know, respite care can be used for many different things. It's done, you know, throughout the life of the case when the case manager is managing that safety and providing services. And it's really defined as that pre-planned arrangement that's temporary relief care to a provider or to a family for a child who has those high behavioral health needs, medical needs, or emotional needs. And so we know that not only children in foster care, but children that we work with throughout child welfare, so CPS and in-home, require additional support to maintain stability in that primary placement. And respite care is a service that our case managers and agencies should consider. And so it can be effective to stabilize that placement or prevent that removal from the child's home and never have them enter foster care. And so eligibility for the licensing for, for respite care that's reimbursable through the CFS licensing unit. These are children under the age of 18 that are involved with the human service zone. There are those prevention cases that are identified through child protection or in-home. They can also be those foster care cases where a child is in North Dakota foster care and is under the custody of a public agency. They could be in foster care through the Division of Juvenile Services. They would be in foster care that are tribal 4E placements. And so you guys may or may not know, but the division has agreements with DJS and our tribal partners to engage in either a foster care placement or that tribal 4E. And so that's how they become reimbursable for respite through our licensing unit. We can also offer respite for our post-adopt or post-guardianship clients that are receiving a subsidy through the Department of Now Health and Human Services. We can also offer respite for those clients that are duly involved. So if a client is you know, in a CPS case, but is also involved with the Human Service Center, and the Human Service Center can refer that child and family um, for respite to stabilize that placement. And so respite can be offered a couple of ways. What is reimbursable through the CFS licensing unit is overnights. We can offer four overnights for a child, um, let me rephrase that, four calendar days for a child who may need it twice a month. That is reimbursable depending on what their behavioral health, medical, or emotional needs may be, or a family may need it only 12 hours per week, a couple hours here and there to help stabilize the placement that's going on with grandma or with mom and dad. And so the nice thing about the respite that we offer through the CFS licensing unit is there is no limit on the number of respite care episodes that a child can have. And so again, if it is required to stabilize that placement and prevent removal and the family needs it, you know, three weekends a month, we are working with the case manager and family to get that respite care approved so the child can remain safely in that home. Many of you guys on the call are licensed foster care providers. You are providing likely 98% of our respite today. However, Respite can also be provided by our licensed child care providers. And so as long as they have that license, we can reimburse the respite as long as they're licensed through the department. And so sometimes we get a lot of questions, is the providers licensed, you know, zero through seven, but can they take that 16 year old? And so we would wanna be working with the licensing unit for child care to see if there's a waiver or something that they can give 
to expand that license to provide respite for that 16 year old because we know that if they're not licensed for that age group, they're, they're technically not a licensed provider to care for that, that 16 year old. The department also uh, did an RFP um, about four months ago and we have entered into a contract with Nexus Path to do daytime respite, which is up to 12 hours per week. And so this is a brand new program for them. They are building it from the ground up. And so it is in the very early stages, but we are working with them to get it implemented statewide. And once it is, providers across the state and custodial agencies will be notified. And so if you're a provider who is thinking, wow, I did not know this was respite, this is news to me, and you didn't know that you're eligible for a child in your home for respite. So we would encourage you to work with your custodial agency. The CFS licensing unit does require pre-approval. And so the reason we require pre-approval is because we need to make sure that this is actually respite. What we've seen again is we know that respite is used very universal, universal. But what we know is that it needs to be, we need to ensure that the child has behavioral health needs or medical or emotional needs that are really taxing for that provider. And this is used as a prevention or to stabilize that placement. And so our human service zones across the state use the, no the North Dakota provider list to identify that placement. The Division of Juvenile Services or our tribal nations are making that diligent first effort to secure a respite home. And in the event they can't secure a respite home, we are working with the providers through the provider list to identify providers who may be eligible or willing to provide respite for the, the child given the short duration. And so when those case managers are submitting the SFN 929, we are approving it for sure within 24 hours. And if not, we're asking a little bit more information or clarifying questions about why respite is required. And so the nice thing about our unit is we knew that reimbursement was taking a significant amount of time to be made to providers. And so as Kelsey said before, we have a clog in our system. We use two different systems to make provider payments um, that you guys see every month from the children you have in your home, but we also use another system for respite and shelter care payments. And so with the creation of the licensing unit, once we know that respite episode has occurred and we have received the second page or the part two of the SFN 929, that you are signing and saying this child has been in my home for the last three days, we, re we reimburse every Friday. So we are making payments to fiscal every single Friday. And so if you guys are having, you know, concerns about respite, how it may have been previously handled, just know that we, once we get the forms and we have everything that we need, we reimburse Friday. And so if you guys have not already been asked, we require a W-9 and a blank voided check to make those payments to you. And so you would be notified right up front, um, likely from Dana Lindemann, that you guys are not set up to receive payments and we need the W-9 and the blank voided check. So a couple of respite care scenarios that are true respite is we have a child who is destroying property. The primary caregiver, whether that is a parent, guardian, or you as a foster care provider is asking help to regroup and you're seeking respite care to provide that temporary relief and support. This is a scenario that would be approved because of the child's behavioral health needs and the need to stabilize that placement. This would be something that we could approve and reimburse to that respite provider at the end after the time that the respite episode has occurred. This is approved respite for our relative caregivers. So we have grandmas and grandpas, aunties and uncles who are not licensed foster parents today, and they are seeking respite as well. So this is an example of a relative caregiver who is caring for their medically fragile infant, so maybe their niece, and um, the child is inconsolable. They require 24 hour care. This relative is in need of a break to regroup and the case manager knows this. The case manager recognizes it and says to the relative caregiver, how can we structure some respite for you? 
What can we do to help support this child in your home and help manage this placement stability? Respite is a great option um, to support that relative caregiver and give grandma or auntie or uncle a break. And so um, that would just be solicited through the case manager who would then work with our unit and we would then set up um, the reimbursement structure that way. And so here's another prevention one. We have a mom that's caring for her children. The child protection worker who is assessing the case is knowing that the child, the children that she's seen is requiring extra supervision because they have temper tantrums that can last for hours at a time. The child protection worker is recognizing that mom would benefit from one weekend of respite care a month to provide her relief and support and to stabilize the children that are in the home. This would be another opportunity that is respite is used as that prevention. So you as foster care providers are likely seeing yourself as a provider who provides foster care to children in North Dakota care, but you guys could also be a provider who provides that prevention service to children who are identified in that CPS assessment or in that in-home case that need that extra help and support. And so we had a provider, um, we had actually many providers that we are gonna hear throughout this training, just talk about their experience. And it's really important for you as providers to hear from your peer, right? Let's hear from someone who's actually providing the service. And so we have um, Teresa Miller who um, resides in Mandan and she's been licensed for quite some time. And she graciously talked to us about what, what she has seen when she's done respite care. And Teresa has done respite care for, again, children who are in foster care, but she's also been identified as a person who does this for a prevention placement. She's been called to help that CPS case or that in-home case so that she can provide stability to those children and to the family. And so she's gonna tell us why um, she would encourage a family to consider respite um, and the stories that she kind of gives um, a brief overview of. Because it helps out a fellow foster family, because I know when I need it, I hope somebody steps up and does it for me. We all kind of know there's like the two week honeymoon where the kids are, you know, really good and they're trying to figure out your home and everything. And when you do respite, you know, you're just kind of like the fun auntie for the weekend. It's just kind of like a sleepover, like if your kids have a sleepover with other kids, like it's kind of really no difference. Um, you just have to do it, try it see if you like it. Like I said, I've, me and my kids have always found that it's kind of a lot more fun. And so many of you guys on the call probably have your own experience providing respite too. This is someone who we um, work with through the CFS licensing unit and likely many of you to reimburse respite. And so we hope that if you have questions, you reach out to us. But this again is a great service that you can offer to your, your fellow foster care provider. Um, but also to those children and families we work with um, and the broad spectrum of child welfare through CPS and in-home. We are going to transition to shelter care. And so shelter care, we've really, um, since the licensing unit was created, really tried to create more awareness about and really emphasize how it relates to our safety framework. And so, when we talk about shelter care and the implementation of the safety framework practice model, the, the practice model really encourages North Dakota to revision how we engage with families and offer support during that crisis. So support and services may not always result in the request for that temporary custody order or the need to open that emergency foster care placement. If a child and family has present danger that's been identified, and out of the home placement is warranted, our agency staff across the state are engaging in those reasonable efforts to prevent removal by identifying appropriate supports and services for the family, which may include a temporary out of home placement with a relative or with a licensed provider. And that includes shelter care. So our shelter care funding that we have through the CFS licensing unit can be used as a diversion and that early intervention for children with an open CPS or in-home case where there's present danger that is existing. 
and placement in shelter care cannot exceed that seven days. And so shelter care may occur because there is that TCO, but it also can be, be that diversion. And what our data will tell us is that we have children across the state that may be coming into care for 96 hours or less. And how can we divert these children from ever entering foster care if we know, for instance, that grandma or auntie is coming from out of state to give that support to that child and family in the event that present danger may exist. And so our eligibility criteria is specific to our human service zones across the state. They can be those prevention cases. So there is no temporary custody order that is obtained. The parents are agreeing to that out-of-home safety plan. They are saying, I know that my child is not safe right now, and I know that I cannot care for them, but if I agree to this, I know that they're not entering foster care. And if they can also be those temporary custody order cases in which present danger is identified and a TCO is required where that public agency is granted custody of them. And so these, again, are specific to human service zones, CPS cases, in-home cases, or foster care cases where that TCO was granted. Shelter care cannot last more than seven days. And so from the time that child is admitting to shelter care, from the time they discharge needs to not exceed seven calendar days. Again, U.S. providers are 98% are of the population who are providing shelter care services to children across the state. We also have licensed child care providers who are licensed um, through the department and carry that license to provide care overnight are also eligible to be reimbursed through the department to provide shelter care services. And so we have- I just, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. One other thing I just wanna add about the childcare providers is we do have jurisdictions in uh, across North Dakota who might solicit um, some connections with a local childcare provider. If a child, um, a family circumstance were to present itself at two o'clock in the afternoon, and utilizing that child care center or that child care home um, just in the interim would be a potential option. That's allowable and we would reimburse it through this um, funding stream. Um, I would say nine out of 10 times um, if that were to present itself, oftentimes they're calling a, a licensed foster parent, you know, call, contacting our foster care providers to, um, to see if there's availability. But with these shelter care situations, it's very, very possible with the examples that you'll see that somebody is available within, you know, a few hours or within a day or two to come and intervene on behalf of the children. Thanks, Kelsey. And so as we present these scenarios, I would encourage you guys to be thinking if this is something that you or your family would consider and are likely or could be already doing. And so in our first scenario, present danger has been identified in the Hedinger home. The agency is, seek is seeking that temporary out-of-home placement, but the agency is working with that family and grandma has been identified, but she's living in Minnesota and she's available to care for the children, but she has identified that she cannot arrive to North Dakota to be that safety support for three more days. The case manager is working with the parents and the parents agree to that out-of-home safety plan for the children to be placed with that licensed provider. So the case manager calls our on-call shelter care provider, explains the situation to them, and the shelter care provider accepts those children into their home. The diversion from foster care does not require that agency to obtain that temporary custody order. The children never need to enter North Dakota foster care. The safety plan is for grandma to arrive and assist with those in-home supports and services for the Hedinger family. The case would remain as an in-home case and we'd be monitored accordingly. The CFS licensing unit would receive that request for reimbursement and we would make that payment to that on-call provider on the Friday following the shelter care episode. 
we've had more and more cases when now that we've been talking about preventative measures and diversion, um, we've had more and more cases that have percolated where custodial agencies, our case managers locally are really being creative. They're really being innovative. And thank you to the foster care providers who have really engaged and had open minds about working with families who are in immediate crisis. But that immediate crisis doesn't necessarily mean that they will have or have a need to be in long-term foster care. And so this example is really good. This is a, it's a real example. All these examples are real, it seems like. We, we pull from what we know. Um, law enforcement pulls over dad for speeding. There's a warrant for dad's arrest. There are three children in his vehicle and CPS is contacted to assess the situation. The CPS worker visits with dad and, and identifies that there's no family or friends available to help care for his children um, for that weekend, but it is known that he will be released from jail on Monday. So let's just say that this is, you know, Thursday or Friday and he's picked up, he's arrested, and these children need to go somewhere. We would have emergency shelter um, available to care for those kids for the weekend. Dad would give his consent, work with that CPS worker who would identify a local foster care provider um, who could do the on-call shelter. And we would then reimburse with shelter care funds in lieu of ever opening that case in foster care. When dad gets his hearing on Monday and is released, there's no reason his children need to be remaining in North Dakota foster care. So it is a really good opportunity for that agency to work with um, our families in our community to support when that crisis occurs and then address what is needed to mitigate that risk from happening again um, and down the road and identify um, steps and measures to engage with dad to ensure stability for those kids post discharge and release from the jail. So this is something that may be new to you as providers, but also something that we at the CFS licensing unit are really excited about. We know that emergencies happen at all hours of the day for our custodial agencies across the state. We know that at two in the morning, if they need a placement, we don't want them to have to call six providers in order to find that safe place for that child. And so what we are trying to build is a robust system across the state that custodial agencies can use in the event that present danger exists and a safe bed is required. This is shelter care on call. And so providers who are licensed and willing to be on call for a period of seven days would receive $100 a week to, to accept those emergency placements. If a child is placed in your home during your on-call week, you would also get the daily rate of each child that's placed in your home. We ask that you're available for all children who are under the age of 18. We know that in some cases, providers have that, that set age range, which they're most comfortable with. But you're gonna hear from providers here in a little bit who, who again, likely had the same concerns or fears that you did, but really tried it to see if this is something that they could do and realized it's only for seven days. And these are short-term placements. Shelter care on-call looks different. Again, it's those prevention cases. Is it that CPS case where present danger is existing and that child needs that safe bed for three days? Or is it that in-home case where the child just needs that safe bed for five days? Or it could be that TCO case where a custodial agency, a human service zone is removing these kids because temporary care is required and there is no parent or guardian who's able to care for them. These are the three cases in which our on-call providers would see. And so I would encourage you guys to think about it. If you have questions, I would encourage you to reach out to myself or Dana and our emails will be in here later. Um, this is something new and we're really trying to support our custodial agencies because again, we know that emergencies happen at all hours of the day and how we can be good partners to support each other when that happens. And so how can you as a provider provide shelter care on call? I would encourage you if you are licensed through um, a, a licensed child placing agency such as YouthWorks or Nexus Path, that you talk to your, your providers directly about this. Um, 
us as the CFS licensing unit are working directly with state homes. And so if you have questions about this, again, contact your licensing specialist or myself and Dana and our emails will be available later. But as a, a provider who's eligible to provide this, your licensing specialist during that initial and renewal licensing is talking to you about this opportunity. You may not be comfortable taking what we would consider a longer term placement and you only want these short term placements. This is a great opportunity for you as providers to engage in that seven days. You could choose to do it one weekend every other month, twice a month, whatever would work for you and your family. We would need that SFN 928 that your licensing specialist is working with you during. We would need that signed. And then again, if you already have given us a W-9 and a blank voided check because you're providing respite, we likely don't need it. But if we did, we would let you know and we would work with you to set up um, how you could provide shelter care on call and what that might look like. Again, so for reimbursing shelter care on call, if the child is at CPS or prevention case in home, the case manager is requesting that through the SFN 931. And so a lot of questions we get is, it is that CPS or in-home case that I got, but I also needed daycare. How does that work? And so what we can do, since you are a licensed provider and the daycare is likely a licensed provider, we can reimburse both of you at the same time on Fridays so that you guys are paid timely. And so we have, um, again, you guys likely hear from Dana Lindemann from the licensing unit. She has reached out to you either via email or she's starting to reach out by phone now to engage providers to ask if they know about it or if they have questions. And so we, again, have started an on-call rotation that is a Friday through Thursday time. This is what a calendar looks like that is available to our human service zones across the state. And so we have four families on call, one out of close to Burley, close to Ward, close to Grand Forks, and close to Cass. They can see that the Smith family is on call in Fargo for these days. What we are asking you as providers who are on call is how many beds or how many temporary beds do you have, not to exceed those six placements of children in foster care. So let's just say you have two beds two permanent beds, and you have one temporary bed. If Cast Human Service Zone would click on the Smith family, they would see that the Smith family has three beds available. So I know that over the weekend, if I have a removal of two kids, I can call the Smith family and say, I have a seven-year-old and I have a 14-year-old who are needing placement. Can we meet in an hour? These are children who have been removed from a TCO. And so what we're really trying to do, knowing that we want to use universal language with our providers and our case managers, is that in this on-call calendar, we have given examples. And Dana is sending out the examples to the providers, is that I'm calling from CAST Human Service Zone for an emergency placement for shelter care on-call that's going to last seven days or less. I have a seven-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl. They're siblings. When can I bring them? And that scenario could change depending on if they were removed from a TCO or they were that CPS or in-home case. But we want you guys to be able to use the same language so that everyone is on the same page, knowing what you're accepting for that child who's going to be there for that seven days or less. And so if you guys have questions about shelter care on call and, and you're a stay home, you should con contact myself or Dana Lindemann. Here's our emails, and we would be happy to either email or call you and talk to you about this opportunity. If you guys have questions about payment specific to being sh a shelter care on-call provider, again, you should email Dana and I, and we will get back to you about whatever questions you have for payment and let you know where it's at in the process. If you have questions or concerns about children who have been placed in your home, during a shelter care on-call rotation, you would contact that placing agency of the child. And so what we've learned is that this is a team effort and it's new. So we know that providers have questions. And so when you have those questions and they're arising, we are trying to work with the custodial agency to 
come to a common ground and understanding of what you as a provider may be asking and the roles and responsibilities of each of us. And so it's really a team effort. And we know that this is new and that change is sometimes hard to learn, but we're all on the same team. And so we're going to hear from two providers in two different areas of the state. Um, we have Jasmine, who's out of Cass County, and then we have Kate and Ryan Jockers, who are out of Morton County. And so we talked to these providers a couple of weeks ago, and we just wanted to know if they had any fears, if they had hesitation about doing this, if they had any worries, and what they would want their peers, you as other providers, to know about shelter care on call. Yeah, I originally actually um, was kind of nervous to take older children um, just because my age is closer to their age. Um, and so that definitely did change when I got my first teenager. Um, I realized that one of the most important parts for them is to make them feel heard. Um, let them know that they can talk to you about anything. Um, be there to listen to them. Um, a lot of the times they don't even want you to say anything. They just want somebody there to live. Yeah, I think what I relieve is is doing it and getting at least one and seeing how it works. And they're like, okay, this isn't so bad. <laughs> um, so I would tell them, the people that are maybe afraid is just, you know, sign up for a week, uh, plan for it, prepare for it, make sure that your schedule is somewhat flexible that week and just, and just give it a try. Uh, and just be ready for a call and be ready to, to help out and just see what happens. You know, it's not like you're committing to a year, you're committing to one week. So just try a week out. Actually, just the experience. If you're unsure whether or not you want to do it, it doesn't hurt to try it out once. And if you don't end up thinking it fits for your family, then that's okay. Um, but you also might try it out once and decide that it's something you want to do every month say that for those that are just trying to get their feet wet, and they want to kind of get a feeling for what this is like, it's a great way to do that. Uh, I know respite's an option too, but this is another option to plan ahead and say, hey, we're going to be available for this week. We're going to be ready for a call. We're going to have a room or a bed ready, uh, and we're going to try it out. So those are two providers who engage in shelter care on call. Again, if you have questions, I would encourage you to reach out to the CFS licensing unit so we can facilitate and answer any of those questions that you have. And we can even show you what it would look like. Um, but this was just a little insight to providers who do this and what they would encourage you as their peers to do as well. And Kelsey, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Brittany. And before we dive deep into this, I'm just trying to answer a couple of these questions. And I see that a question came in about daycare. And so in the event that the family, the, the foster care provider works during the day and they would need daycare to help do this, we do have reimbursement to help offset those costs of needs. Now, I know case managers have tried to help figure that out. Sometimes the children actually have daycare um, already established. And so that's helpful, um, getting that information, but it is reimbursable. So that wouldn't be a cost. It, it might be a sound like an initial barrier though. I understand that. Like if there isn't daycare set up and you don't have a situation already in, in order, um, but we would reimburse for it in the event that the licensed daycare did, um, exist for you. Um, we had a question come in, Brittany, um, specific to any stats. And, you know, every Friday, um, Brittany and Dana send me the claims report, and then we authorize that over to fiscal. So I have an, an idea of the volume of respite and shelter claims that we get. But the question that really came in was specific to, um, do we have any stats around like the percentage of foster care providers that exist already in our state? who are doing shelter care versus respite. And like, if they're the shelter on call, how many times like every week that they're on, are they getting called every week? Are they getting called and they're taking up three, four of those seven days with shelter care placements or sometimes none at all? Do you have any so, idea? 
on that? Yeah. So, so it really ebbs and flows is what I can tell you. I know for instance, um, in Grand Forks last week, I think they removed 11 kids. We know that a, one provider cannot care for 11 kids. And so if you're a shelter care on-call provider and you have the temporary bed space for one and then two permanent beds, they could place three children with you. And then they're gonna have to start calling other local providers to help assist with this. In other cases, you could get one call a week or none at all. It really just depends. But we have been meeting with um, our custodial case managers from our human service zones to really use this as that prevention tool um, and for those TCO cases. And so we've seen an uptick in some of these prevention cases that they're identifying present danger. And grandma's literally taking three days to get here, but she know they know she's coming and they need a safe place for the kids until grandma can get here. And so really it ebbs and flows. I would encourage you to, to reach out to us, ask questions, try it for a week. You're not you're not required to do it, but it's something that you can do to offer help and assistance to the custodial agency in your area. And so the the list that we have, we identify you as, you know, Burley Morton, Cass, Grand Forks. And so you could get a call from Mandan if you reside in Bismarck because they have an emergency removal. It, it just depends. You could be available provider for those agencies that are around surrounding your wherever you're residing it just really depends well and there's two comments in the chat so thank you to laura and sherry for responding you know laura had done on call eight times and only had one call for one child mm -hmm. you know so it does really depend another example was doing um, on call three times and has not had any calls but also got some other messages coming to me and, and one of the questions coming from case management and CPS side is when and how do I solicit a foster care provider in an emergency? So we are trying to build the shelter on-call program. We know that we don't have this like abundance of hundred providers to, to just be available with the on-call, but the reality is all of you as foster care providers are basically on call. I mean, they, you're getting those calls at 8.30 at night. You're getting those calls on Sunday afternoon at, you know, one o'clock. You're getting the call at five in the morning. So you're getting that without being an on-call provider. So it's not wrong if you're a case manager or CPS worker to be contacting providers if you're in an emergent need. Um, but if you are an area and knowing that we only have the four areas today, we know we're expanding, we know we're going to grow and have more on-call um, providers available to us. If you're in Fargo, Grand Forks, Bismarck, or Minot, please call the on-call provider because they're they're waiting. They're in the wind. They're right there um, and wanting to be a service support to the agency. But if you're in a more rural area that maybe doesn't have the on-call provider available, um, then I know a lot of our foster care providers um, become the, the first point of contact. So knowing that you're a first point of contact anyway, it's something for you to consider um, about being a, an on-call in those more rural areas. So just something to think about. Um, <clears throat> we're going to hop into recruitment and retention and talk about how additional opportunities are presented to providers. So we have case managers who are all over the state working so diligently to locate placements, shelter, respite, help you organize if there's a substitute care arrangement that needs approval or, you know, making and granting that authority for those placement decisions to be made. On the flip side of it, there's a whole nother layer of engagement that providers and case managers can participate in. And so we don't wanna uh, minimize that. Um, we have some pretty great um, clips here that show the recruitment and retention efforts um, across North Dakota. And when the unit went live and our contract with the CFSTC allowed for some advertising and marketing um, dollars to really expand our recruitment and retention efforts, this is one of the display tables that was most recently put up um, this summer. And so recruitment and retention um, has the new tablecloths and the banners. We have all kinds of um, opportunities there to really spread the wealth and, and the words about what foster um, care providers can do. The next slide shows uh, a few more of those 
um, examples. And so you'll see that tall banner along the, the center of the slide here. Um, we have them on the table. We also have them standing behind the table in the lower um, left corner. And so these table booths become really critical in having engagement strategies and learning and hearing and asking questions about what it means to be a foster care provider. Now, everyone is welcome to participate in the effort as a coalition member. And so if you are really interested and you have ideas, I mean, I was just on a, a recruitment and retention uh, work group meeting last week, and we have a foster care provider who is a parent rep on that. And she was talking about all these great ideas of where she could put materials and where she could get information out and how she could help the local licensor kind of do some running and, and bring um, materials out to the community. Or you work at a location where you would really be able to like have materials there and be able to hand them out or be able to have them available. Maybe you work in a clinic and having the coloring pages and that information available would be an opportunity. Just let your licensing specialist know that and we'll get materials. Like we can spread this wide and far. And we've learned in this work for every 10 families that we recruit to be a foster care provider, we lose nine. And we lose those nine based off of basic, just the, changes that happen, people move, maybe they've adopted a child. It's just attrition in how this sort of um, circle of effects happen. And um, oftentimes it's because they're they're moving, they're maybe moving from the east to the west or they're moving out of state. We can only issue a license in the state of North Dakota. Um, if that adoption happens, which does happen with some of our families, um, that's wonderful to achieve permanency, but then families are feeling like I've kind of hit my mark and, and I've done my due diligence and, and that's wonderful as well. What we don't want to have happen is have families choose to discontinue being a foster care provider in North Dakota because they're not receiving the support. And we we don't want families to feel alone because this truly is uh, provi your providers of service. You're providing a huge service to our community. And we as licensing want to ensure that you're supported, that you're getting the training you need, that you're being heard, that we're doing our check-ins with you um, each quarter, that we um, have opportunities for you to ask questions and have share and support and um, you know, be available to work amongst one another. But then we also want to ensure that our case managers in our public agencies have the resources available to them to support you. And some of it is as simple as returning phone calls and responding to emails timely. Or if you have a medical question for a child that just saw a provider, that you have that responsiveness from the agencies. And that is our best way to show support to our foster care providers is being available. Um, and sometimes that can be hard when caseloads get um, big, get big. But recruitment and retention has done a number of things to really try and ensure that that it's not just about gaining all those new homes. Getting new homes is huge and critical because for every ten we lose nine. But we recognize that the retention strategies that our state must have because we want to keep families um, as providers is really important. And so if you are interested at all in being part of that um, mission to do recruitment and retention efforts through a coalition, please let your licensing specialist know, and we'd be happy to connect you. We only have four coalitions in North Dakota. Um, they meet uh, throughout the month. Usually they meet one time a month. Um, the time varies dependent on the location, um, but uh, it would be worth the opportunity to do it. And we know that if somebody is living up in Cavalier, they're not able to get to, you know, let's just say Carrington to do the event. But we do have a licensing specialist in the Carrington area. So we would, you know, solicit our local licensing specialist to, to help spearhead an activity or an event or a speaking engagement. Maybe you're a member of the Lions Club or a member of the VFW and you feel like it would be important to have someone come and speak on behalf. You could team up as a local provider and talk about your experience as a foster care provider and um, try to help deliver the message about the children in need in our state um, and using that as a coalition opportunity. This is one of the marketing campaigns that was um, sent out when our um, advertising 
had really put into the budget a, a strong push on getting the foster or adopt um, word mark out. And so um, I have to credit CFSTC, really did an amazing job with the um, CFS Training Center, just really engaging in messaging and ensuring that folks were aware. Um, that hotline that you see on there, the 1-833-378-4663, is the, what we reference as a hotline or the clearinghouse. And that's where all of our inquiries go. So Carissa Cox, who is our current recruitment and retention specialist out of CFSTC, um, answers all of those calls from prospective families curious about what is you know fostering or I'm hearing more about this adoption stuff and I'm just curious like do you have a connection or a referral and she troubleshoots and answers many questions every day um, helping to help families make that decision to take the leap um, and we'll go to the next slide one of the things that we realize is um, sometimes it takes you know, potentially six, seven, eight times before someone sees it, hears it, reads it before they act on it. And so um, we try to get as much information out into the communities as we can. Um, the task force is one of our avenues in which we are soliciting information. Uh, right now, we, you know, we don't have everyone participating in the task force meetings. Um, so I would, you know, if there is someone interested who really sees you know, the systemic change that could happen. Uh, we're really looking for those visionary um, providers who could say, here's a situation. I think we have a solution. Um, not just coming to, to con, you know, relay concerns and deliver, you know, poor messaging, rather coming to say, here's a real issue. It's impacting not just me here in this part of the state, but it's impacting my peers that are service providers in other parts of the state. Those are the things that we can influence change on and make policy or amendments to the work that we do to help all providers um, and really influence the system. So the task force has been great. That's been one opportunity. Another opportunity that foster care providers could um, decide to engage in is the foster, um, the foster parent mentoring program. You also could receive support from the mentoring program. So it's important that you recognize in the event, maybe you're a newer foster care provider and you just have questions and you really could benefit from talking to a more seasoned uh, foster care provider about the child who um, has some disruptive behaviors or I feel like all they do is destroy my property and I'm losing my cool and I need to talk to someone. That a foster parent mentor is so important in maintaining and retaining our families. We also have worked directly with ASK and we have um, the post-adopt mentor program. And so those who are mentors, they receive a very small stipend. We wish we could give you a lot more, but um, $50 a month um, just to be available and answer some questions and get teamed up with a family um, to, to help support their efforts and their growth as foster um, care providers or as adoptive families who are brand new to the adoption and, and maybe things are feeling a little uneasy at times. Um, it's okay to solicit that feedback from someone who's also been through it. Um, so if you need the service, or are interested in more information about the service, you can um, contact your licensing specialist or Carissa Cox at um, CFSTC. The middle section on here is new. It's a new program that is under development with our Native American Training Institute. And so what this is, is they are seeking out ICWA cultural liaisons. Um, which really means looking and soliciting families who are Native American, um, either enrolled members or enrollable members of one of our North Dakota tribes or um, a tribe that is even um, out of state. So they wouldn't have to be in a North Dakota tribe. But the goal is that many of our children who we do have in foster care have Native American heritage. We have, you know, over 30% of the state placements. And then we have a number of tribal custody cases, which brings our percentage up to about 40, 42% of our cases in North Dakota foster care are Native American children. And I'll just speak for myself, if I'm the foster care provider, I would greatly benefit from someone who could help connect the dots with cultural um, connections, be able to provide me some feedback and guidance as it relates to like maybe a recipe or an event or some sort of a 
um, engagement strategy based on the culture and the tribe in which the youth is involved. So we know that there are many Caucasian families who serve Native American children. We are always seeking more Native American families to help serve our populations of young people. But if we don't have the one-to-one -one number of Native American foster homes to Native American children in foster care, we want to be able to ensure we connect the dots on the culture. And so this cultural liaison program will be really great um, if you are wanting to seek that service and get on a list to talk to a cultural liaison, you can contact Nady. But more importantly, if you are interested in becoming a cultural liaison, the $50 a month um, stipend is available for that program as well. So it's another opportunity for providers. This is um, one of the, the stickers that you might see on a popcorn bag at a baseball game, or you might see um, in a, a church flyer. Um, maybe it is connected on some of the materials out and around um, town. But this is one of the blue stickers that's been going out to schools and different, um, different settings all across North Dakota. Um, just again, soliciting and asking folks to call that number. And I'm going to look here quick to see if there's any additional questions that have come up. We are sitting at 820. Um, we would be able to, I think, Brittany, are we going to open up some lines? Are we comfortable with that? If there are questions, we could answer a few of those questions because we have a little time to do so. Um, I don't see any additional questions that have come in to the chat. Um, but if at any time, and we would offer this to our case managers, as well as our foster care providers, to please feel free to contact us. We know that there are times where conflict occurs and there's a concern in the home or a placement situation is not going as planned. And we we will always have our phone line. We have uh, four coordinators who are managing um, the CFS licensing inbox and our main line. Um, at 701-328-2322 from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Now, we don't have an on-call system at the CFS licensing unit, but we sure hope that every time there's a placement in your home, you at least get some indicator of who you call in an emergency, and, and it should be the case manager or the case management on-call number within that agency. And so be um, be encouraging yourselves and reminding yourselves that when those situations do exist, we want you to contact those um, case managers directly and let them know that there's an issue. Um, if for some reason you're not getting a hold of someone and you need some support, feel free to contact us. Um, one of the questions, um, I was confused. If you are a foster parent who cannot find daycare for the foster placement, do you get extra reimbursement for providing daycare on top of the regular stipend? So no, um, that would not be the case. But in the event that we could find child care, we would pay for the child care. So the daily rate for a shelter care placement is $38 a day. And then if you have daycare available um, and they charge $30 a day, we'll pay you also that $30 a day. So you get reimbursed for that child's daycare but you won't get paid, it, it would be double dipping if we were reimbursing a child care provider, um, sorry, if we were reimbursing a foster care provider, the daily rate for shelter, and then also giving that same person a child care rate. So we can't do that, but we can pay two providers. All right, and then Amy put a note in here to make sure that the two parent households attending um, put their information in the chat, so we include you all in our list. Um, if at any time you need have a question or a concern, we have a great crew posted up here on the screen from the CFS licensing unit, and we also have strong connections with Nexus Path, uh, YouthWorks, our URM program, and our tribal nations who do licensing studies as well. Brittany, do you have any final thoughts? I don't. I would just encourage you guys, if you guys have questions about shelter care or respite, to please reach out to the licensing unit so we can facilitate answering those questions. Um, and thank you guys for attending tonight.